On Friday, we learned there was two basic ways of charging objects, and we called those two basic ways charging by conduction and charging by induction. Can anybody tell me what the big difference is, the big fundamental difference is between induction and conduction? Yeah, Blake? Uh, one's like touching and the other one isn't. Okay, one usually involves touching, although not always. The other one never involves touching. Which one is it that usually involves touching? Is it conduction or induction? Conduction, conduction did you say? Usually yeah, yep. Yeah. Conduction usually involves touching. So if you've got a situation where two objects are touching, you know that it's conduction for sure. But if you have two a situation where two objects are not touching, you don't know which it is. So that's not the best way of differentiating between the two of them, but it's a way that sometimes works. What's the other way? Yes, conduction always involves a transfer of charge. Usually is good, always is better. Always involves a charge transfer. Do you guys know what the symbol Q means? Charge, right? Always involves a charge transfer. Whereas induction never involves touching, and induction never involves a charge transfer. Although we put a little asterisk beside that, right? Because we learned on Friday that induction, there actually can be a charge transfer taking place within induction, but not between the object that's doing the charging and the object that's being charged. We'll explain that again in a few minutes here. Conduction, we break it down into two subcategories. We call it charging by friction, which is basically involves rubbing two things together. That's, that's governed by the law of conservation of charge, right? If I have two objects, both that are neutral, and I rub them together, and one becomes minus four as a result of that rubbing, then the other one will become plus four. It's neutral, and neutral gives me zero. Negative four and positive four gives me zero. The law of conservation of charge says the total charge must remain the same, and in that case, it did. Okay? By the way, if I rub two things together, both neutral, one becomes negative four, one becomes positive four, which one gained electrons, the negative or the positive one? Which one gained the electrons? One of them gained, one of them lost, right? Which one gained? The negative four, and the other one, of course, the one that becomes positive four, has lost electrons. Hasn't gained protons, right? We can't gain protons because those protons are too tightly bound in the nucleus by the strong nuclear force. The electrons are bound to the nucleus as well, but it's an electrostatic force and it's not quite as strong, so it's easier to break. Charging by contact, or sometimes we just call it charging by conduction, involves literally touching two things together or bringing two things close enough together for charges to arc or charges to jump. Sometimes that happens. We'll still call it charging by contact. Okay? Uh, and, that, and the goal of that is, is always to balance out the charges. Do they always balance out? No. No, they won't always balance out, but that's the goal is to always balance out. Give me a situation where the charges wouldn't actually balance. Sorry? No? Give me a situation where the charges wouldn't actually balance. No, we're going, we're going uh, charging by contact here. Touch two things together. They want to balance out. Say we have, uh, let's say we have 0 and 10. They want to balance out to be 5 and 5, right? Sometimes they won't. Okay, sometimes they might balance out to be 2 and 8. Give me a situation where they wouldn't quite balance out. Logan, is your hand going up there? No, I thought your hand was starting to go up. Do you have an answer for me? Like a pattern? Sorry? Like a pattern? No, no. We're not talking about some kind of chemical generation of electricity here. What if I have this tiny little metal ball and this massive big metal ball and I touch them together? Well, the massive one's going to be able to hold more charge, right? The, the static ball that we used the other day, Wednesday or Thursday last week, um, is able to hold a lot more charge than, let's say, my ring could hold. So if I touch the two together, they wouldn't balance out, right? Okay, my, uh, zero and plus 10 might be, oh, sorry, zero and minus 10 might become minus two and minus eight. Still governed by the law of concentration of charge where the total charge remains minus 10, okay, but they're not quite balanced out in that case. Um, generally, when we have a situation where two objects touch, they will be equal size, equal shape, equal material, so that they will balance out. But in the event that they don't balance out, they're still gonna become like charges, right? My ring touches that Van der Graaff generator well, it might, might not become balanced, but it's still going to become negative. The ring is going to be negative, and the dome of the generator is going to be negative as well. All right. 
Now let's go to induction. This is the harder one. Uh, induction involves uh, two categories, temporary separation of charge and a permanent charge. Let's draw a neutral object that we're bringing a, let's make it a positive object nearby. Tell me what's going to happen to the positives inside that neutral object. What, pardon me? They're not going to move anywhere. They're going to stay where they are, right? Tell me what's going to happen to the negatives inside that neutral object. They're going to be, they're going to be pulled towards it, right? Not necessarily all of them, although we usually draw it as if all of them are moving over there, just so that you can see the effect here. Bottom line is, the side that's closest to the positive is going to become negative, and the side that's furthest away is going to become positive. Notice, the side that's closest is negative, it's oppositely charged. Okay, this neutral object will be attracted to this positive object because of that temporary separation of charge that we have here. We call it temporary, by the way, because if we take this away, this goes back to the way that it was. Let's draw another one now. Positive, positive, negative, negative, neutral object, right? Let's bring a negative nearby this time. What's going to happen to the protons in there? Nothing. They don't go anywhere, right, because of that strong nuclear force. What happens to the electrons? Eh, it doesn't take much to move those around. Rub a balloon against your hair, rub, move those around, right? They're going to be pushed away to the left-hand side, leaving me with negative. and positive. All right? Now, of course, this one's going to be attracted as well, this neutral object, because the side that's closest to the negative is oppositely charged, it's positive. Charged objects attract neutral objects because of that temporary separation of charge. Finally, how do I make it permanent? How do I make either one of these permanent? I want to charge it negative or I want to charge it positive. Yep, or? Yeah, attach a ground wire. It doesn't matter where I attach that ground wire. Yesterday, or Friday, I should say, I drew it on the left-hand side. Today, I'll draw right there. doesn't make any difference. Bottom line is, any way you look at it, you're going to get negatives pulled up from the ground. It's a positive object doing the charging. Negatives get pulled up from the ground. We add a bunch of extra negatives in there. We cut the ground wire, and now there's no way for them to go back home into the ground. So now we've got a negatively charged object. Okay, so regardless of where you put the ground wire, if you want to charge something negative by induction, bring a positive object nearby, and you will charge it negative by induction. Okay? Now, for the other one, let's attach a ground wire to it. You know what? Let's not, actually. Let's attach some big ball to it. What's the effect of that? The exact same thing. Okay, electrons are going to get pushed away from this over into here. That leaves us with a net positive charge on this uh, little black ball that we had here. If we separate these now, then it's a permanent positive charge. All right? Now, I know we talked about this on Friday, but some of you will get this to say, like, look, there's conduction taking place there. There's conduction taking place when electrons are moving from this guy to this guy, or even when it's moving from the ground to that, uh, to that ball up top there. But we still call the overall process induction because this thing and this thing that's causing the charging isn't transferring charge and it isn't touching, all right? Still, still induction, even though there's conduction taking place within. Good? All right. I want to look at, uh, right now, a couple of uh, real-life applications of this beyond touching a fridge and a stove at the same time, which, as we all know, um, happens all the time touch the fridge and the stove at the same time, get the shock, but uh, maybe some more, um, slightly more real life and uh, normal examples of when we could apply this. Uh, this is, uh, there's a couple diagrams on the back side of the last example sheet that I gave you. It's in color. You see this red at the top of the page. I want you to flip to that now. 
That first diagram is what we call an electrostatic precipitator. It's, a, it's an air filter, basically, is what it is. Okay, in my furnace, and in your furnace at home, you've got a furnace filter so that when the air gets pumped through, gets blown through the furnace to heat up, it actually gets filtered. So the air that comes back up through your furnace vents um, is cleaner air. But it's not filtered electrostatically. If it was, it would be better. It would give you a more pure air if it was filtered electrostatically. Here's why. Take a look at the left-hand side of this diagram. We have air being blown through this. Okay, and this air contains all kinds of different things, including little pollutants, okay, including little dust particles, including little bacteria or viruses or whatever. It includes all kinds of tiny little things that are being blown through the air. And these things are, these green little, we'll call them dust particles, are neutral. For the most part, they're neutral. These neutral dust particles blow past these blow past and touch these blue um, rods. And these blue rods are charged negatively by a power supply. We've got it drawn as a, as a battery there, but of course it's more likely to be actually charged by having had it plugged into a wall or something like that, right? It's being charged electrically though, charged negatively. Now, as these neutral dust particles come in contact with these negatively charged rods, what happens to the dust particles? They become negative. They want to balance out, right, with these, with these negatively charged rods. Now, in all likelihood, they don't, because these rods are likely to be able to hold a lot more charge than the dust particles, right? But the dust particles still become negatively charged. So we had these green neutral dust particles. We have these, these light-colored blue negatively charged dust particles. They keep getting blown through by this fan. And now as they get blown through these positively charged red plates, what happens to them? As these negatively charged dust particles get blown through these positively charged plates, what happens? Somebody said it. I heard somebody whisper it. They stick to it. They get attracted to it, right? Negatively charged dust particles get attracted to positively charged plates. So, what comes out the other side? Well, the air that was blown through, right? Did you hear them? No? The air that was blown through minus these dust particles that were attracted to these positively charged plates. Make sense? The, look, neutral dust particles would be attracted to the positive plates as well. Okay, but it wouldn't be as big of an effect as if we charge them negative. So let's pump them through these negative bars first. Charge them negative by conduction. Right? Charge them negative by conduction and then attract them electrostatically by induction to these positively charged plates so they stick to it and then it's just fresh air coming out the other side. What's the benefit of that over the, over the filter that you have in your furnace? The filter you have in your furnace is purely mechanical, right? You get this mechanical filter that will filter out particles because of the fibers that are in those furnace filters. Okay. Little particles make it through. Okay, little particles make it right through. Here, it doesn't matter how small the particle is. If the particle is negatively charged, that particle is going to get attracted to the, neg the positively charged plate. Make sense? Listen, that's not something that you're likely to be asked on a test or an exam. If you are, hey, great. You got a heads up on it. A little bit of, a, little bit of an advantage on that. Um, this is just an example that is like something that you could be asked. Okay, the idea is that uh, on an exam, when you see something that's completely new to you like this, okay, you have some sort of fighting chance at being able to analyze it based on the principles that we've learned because we've gone through a couple of examples. Okay, let's do another one. This is, uh, this is the fence in my backyard uh, in, in Okotoks here, um, surrounding my pool by the ocean um, okay, sorry, it's not, my, it's not the fence in my backyard of my house here. It's the fence of my backyard of my summer home in the Caribbean. Yeah, that's it. Um, this is the house that, that I'll have when I win the lottery on Wednesday. Um, you can see that I got this nice pool with this nice uh, deck around the pool. And I don't even know why you got a pool because you got an ocean behind it. But uh, anyways, it's got a nice, uh, nice uh, wrought iron fence around it. Um, 
But there's a little scratch in that fence, so I, I want it to look good, so I've got to paint it. But I don't want to paint it by using a paintbrush, because that's going to take me forever, right? So I want to use an air compressor and blow the paint on it or spray the paint onto it. But that's going to make a mess, right? Like that's going to make a mess everywhere if I spray paint onto this, uh, onto this fence. Well, it's not going to make a mess if I use electrostatic painting like they used to paint cars. The idea of electrostatic painting is this. Firstly, this metal fence, it's touching the ground, right? It's grounded. Secondly, this paint nozzle that would, this little hose would go into with the paint, right? And uh, there would be an air compressor attached to that so that it would blow the paint up through the paint nozzle. Inside this paint nozzle right here is a little negatively charged, uh, negatively charged rod. Could be positive, but it doesn't really matter. We'll make it negative. This negatively charged rod comes into contact with paint particles as the paint particles are blown past it. So these neutral paint particles become neutral paint particles as they touch this negatively charged rod become negative. Charging by conduction, right? Or specifically charging by contact. They want to balance out, although the paint particles probably aren't going to develop the charge that the, um, that the rod has. Bottom line is, paint particles come out negatively charged. Why is that a big deal? Well now, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, the fence isn't positively charged right now, uh, but the fence, is, the fence is neutral and it's grounded, so it provides us with an opportunity to have uh, not neutral paint particles spraying against a neutral fence, but negative paint particles spraying against a neutral fence. That means that these paint particles are going to be attracted towards the neutral fence. We ground it so that the, negative, the, the excess negative charges would end up going down through the ground, right? So you don't walk up to the fence and get a shock, right? Does that make sense? Um, although in this case, right, it's already grounded, right? It's naturally grounded. Um, if you look at, let's say, a fence post from above here, okay, it would look something like this, right? We blow the, the paint at it, and what happens? Well, in the front, it just hits it, right? But even the stuff that comes around the side here, as it gets electrostatically attracted, it kind of curves around like this. Like this. What are the advantages of electrostatic painting? Which, by the way, would only work with the metal like this. Why wouldn't it work if you were painting your deck? Why wouldn't it work well if you were painting your deck? Because wood's um, not as good as metal. Yeah, wood's a, a very poor conductor. Um, so this metal fence works really, really well. A car, painting a car works really, really well. What are the advantages of it? We get a lot less wasted paint, right? We might get some wasted paint, but we get a lot less wasted paint. Because this stuff, look, that was blowing off to the side here and it was going to completely miss, which was about two-thirds of the paint that I was spraying at this, ends up being attracted towards the back of it. We also get more even coverage. Right? More even coverage because not only are you painting the front, you're, you're almost painting the whole thing at the same time. Make sense? Okay. Uh, last little thing here, and then I'm going to stop this recording and start a new one for, uh, for a new topic here. Um, you see up on the board right now a device called an electroscope. I pulled out an electroscope on Friday to show you guys, but uh, then I broke it. Uh, it doesn't work because the two little balls in this electroscope are not connected anymore and I can't reconnect them. Um, so that's okay. It's not a big deal. I'll explain to you how it actually works. An electroscope is a device that detects charge. That's all it does. It detects charge. It doesn't tell us how much we have. It doesn't tell us what kind we have, positive or negative. It just detects the presence or absence of charge. And sometimes it's a shape like, well, like this real one up here with two little, call them pith balls on the end of it. Pith is the material from the inside of a plant, and it's really, really light. Put foil over it, paint it with a foil coating, and holds the electric charge really, really well. Sometimes they have these two really, really thin foil leaves, as we have in the diagrams up on the board here. Sometimes it's in an Erlenmeyer flask. Sometimes it's in a rectangular container. It doesn't matter. Okay, an electroscope always consists of a metal ball up here, 
a rod, and then two little metallic pith balls down here, or two little th um, thin pieces of foil down there. One of the two. Now the idea here is this. When I bring a charged object nearby, let's make it negative in this case, this electroscope will detect the presence of that negative charge by causing the leaves to spread apart. The leaves will do this. Instead of being like this, hanging straight down, they're going to do this. How come? Well, let's say that we have, well, let's say the uh, electroscope is neutral. with an equal number of protons and, and electrons, right? What's going to happen to the protons in this electroscope as a result of this negative thing coming nearby? Nothing. What's going to happen to the electrons? Well, not all of them get pushed down, but lots of them are going to get pushed down into here. The leaves that were neutral are now negative, so the leaves that were neutral and are now negative will end up spreading apart because they repel each other. So we just detected the presence of charge because the leaves spread apart, because like charges repel. What if I brought a positive object nearby? What if I brought a positive nearby? Well, What's going to happen to the protons? Nothing. What's going to happen to the electrons? Not all of them. We'll just draw it as if all of them get pulled up here. That leaves the ball of the electroscope negative, but it leaves the leaves. Look, they're positive. Positive repels. Look, we get the exact same effect here. The leaves repelled each other. The leaves spread apart. Does the leaves spreading apart tell us we have charge? Yes. Does it tell us how much charge we have? No. Does it tell us what kind of charge we have? No, because in either case, positive or negative, cause the leaves to spread apart. What if I did this? What if I... What if I grounded it? I can ground it by just touching it or by literally attaching a wire. This positive object wants to pull up negatives from as far away as it can. It was pulling it up from the leaves. Now it's going to pull up negatives from the ground. It's going to put a whole bunch of extra negatives everywhere in here. What happens to the leaves? They're spread apart. But they're spread apart because the leaves are negative cut the ground wire, what happens? They stay there because there's no way for the electrons to get back. Okay? I have a similar thing going on over here. I have a similar thing going on over here if we ground this one. It doesn't matter which side we ground it on. What's going to happen here? We push the negatives down into the leaves. Now, we're actually going to take those negatives that were down in the leaves everywhere in here, and we're going to push them down into the ground. Leaves are positive. They still spread apart, but now because they're positive instead of negative. We cut that ground wire, and it goes back, or and, uh, the electrons are stuck in the ground, so it stays exactly where they are. It stays spread apart. Not forever. Right? Eventually, you're going to lose charge through the air, but for a while. Right?